to deliver his talk today titled The Quran, A Global Necessity. But before that, I will have to try my best to introduce him, even though he doesn't require an introduction. Dr. Zahir Abdul Rahman Karim Naik, Abdul Karim Naik, is a medical doctor by professional training. He is renowned as a dynamic international orator on Islam and comparative religion. In the last 27 years, Dr. Zahir Naik delivered over 2,000 public talks in more than 40 different countries across the world. In 2006, Dr. Zahir Naik founded Peace TV Network, which is the largest religious satellite channel network in the world, which is also producing in different languages and hope to produce in 10 known languages, inshallah. With over 100 million viewership, of which 25 of them are non-Muslims. In April 2012, his public talk in India was attended by over 1 million people, being one of the largest gathering in the world for any religious lecture by a single orator. Also, his 2017 talk in Indonesia and 2019 in, in Malaysia attracted more than 100,000 people. Dr. Zahir Naik was ranked number 82 in the world 100 most influential people in India, a list published by Indian Express in the year 2009 and ranked most influential Muslim um, in the world published by Georgetown University in the last 13 editions from 2011 to this year 2023. In the list of the top 100 cumulative influence over 100 over 10 years, Dr. Zahir Naik was ranked number 79. Sheikh Ahmed Deidat, rahmatullahi alayh, the world famous orator on Islam and comparative religion who had called Dr. Zahir Naik Deidat plus in 1994, presented a pledge in May 2000 with an engraving Son, what you have done in four years had taken me 40 years to accomplish. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. In 2013, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, ruler of Dubai, presented to Dr. Zahir Naik a prestigious Dubai International Holy Quran Award Islamic Personality of 2013. In 2013, the king and head of state of Malaysia awarded Dr. Zahir Naik the highest award of Malaysia. And also in 2014, Sheikh Dr. Sultan bin Mohammed Al Qasmi, ruler of Sharjah, presented to Dr. Zahir Naik Sharjah Award of Voluntary Work for the year 2013. In 2014, Dr. Zahir Naik was also awarded another award by uh, Republic of Gambia, the highest national award in Gambia by the President of Gambia, as well as the Honorary Doctor of Human Letters, uh, by the Governor Councillor of the University of Gambia. In 2015, the custodian of the two holy mosques, King, Suleiman, King Salman bin Abdul Aziz Al Saud presented a prestigious award, King Faisal International Prize for the services to Islam in 2015 to Dr. Zahir Naik. Dr. Zahir Naik has also uh, more than 23 million followers on his Facebook page, which is the highest among any religious English speaker in the world. And more than that, 3.4 million subscribers in his YouTube channel. Finally, Dr. Zahir Naik appears regularly in, on many international TV channels in more than 175 countries of the world. More than 100 of these talks, dialogues, debates, are available on DVDs. He has authored also many books on Islam and comparative uh, religion. Now and without further ado, I would now request our special guest speaker to deliver his talk today. Dr. Zahir, Tafadhal.
আলহামদুলিল্লাহ আলহামদুলিল্লাহ ওসলাত ওসলাম আল রসুল্লাহাবিজমী আম্মাবাদ আউজবিল্লাহ মিন শৈতন রজিম বসমিল্লা রহমান রহিম ওইন কুন তুম ফি রাই বিম মিম্মা নজলনা আলাপ দিনা ফাতু বি সুরত মিম মিসলি ওদ উ শোদা আগমিনুল্লাহ ওইন কুন তুম সাদিন ফাইলাম তফলু ওলম তফলু ফতকুন্না লতি বকুদুন্নাহিদারা ওয়দতুল কাফরিন রবিশ আলী সদরি ওসলি আমরি ওহলুল উগদত মিল লিসানি হফক কাউলি my special elders and my dear brothers and sisters i welcome all of you with their islamic greetings assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh may peace mercy and blessings of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of almighty god be on all of you it is an honor and a pleasure for me to be back in this beautiful country of oman i would like to thank the government of the sultanate of oman and the ministry of awqaf and islamic affairs for hosting me for this lecture tour this is my third time that i'm coming to this country of oman the first time i came was in 2006 the second was 2009 and now after a long span of 14 years alhamdulillah i'm back in this country Jazakallah shukran. The topic of today's talk of mine is the Quran a global necessity. The glorious Quran is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which was revealed to the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran in surah Rad chapter number 13 verse number 38 Allah says wa kulli kulli had wa kulli ajlin kitab in every age have we sent a revelation according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every age Allah has sent a revelation by name there are four revelations mentioned in the Quran the Torah the Zabur the Injil and the Quran the Torah was the wahi the revelation which was given to Moses peace be upon him the zabur was the wahi the revelation which was given to David peace be upon him and the injil was the wahi the revelation which was given to Jesus peace be upon him isa alaihi salam and the quran was the last and final revelation which was revealed to the last and final messenger prophet muhammad peace be upon him but there were several revelations that allah has sent for example the quran speaks about sufi ibrahim the books that were given to prophet abraham peace be upon him but the name is not mentioned so there were several revelations sent on the face of the earth by name only four are mentioned in the quran but all the revelations that came before the last and final revelation of the glorious quran they were meant only for a particular group of people and they were meant for a particular time period but because the glorious quran is the last and final revelation it is not meant only for the muslims or for the arabs it is meant for the whole of humanity because this last and final revelation the glorious quran is meant for the whole of humanity it is a global necessity allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the quran in surah ibrahim chapter number 14 verse number 1 that we have given the book to thee that is prophet muhammad peace be upon him so that he may lead the human kind from darkness to light not only the muslims not only arabs but the quran says prophet muhammad peace be upon him would lead the whole human kind from darkness to light allah repeats the message in surah ibrahim chapter number 14 verse number 52 Here is the message for mankind let them take warning there from let them know there is then god and let the men of understanding take heed allah says in surah baqara chapter number 2 verse number 185 ramadan was the month in which the glorious quran was revealed 
as a guide to humankind, as a criteria to judge right from wrong. And Alhamdulillah, today was the first day of this holy month of Ramadan. And Allah makes it holy because the Quran was revealed in this month. Allah further says in Surah Zumur, chapter number 39, verse number 41, that we have given the book to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, so that he will instruct the humankind. So the glorious Quran was not meant only for the Muslims or the Arabs, it was meant for the whole of humanity. The glorious Quran, it is the future world constitution. It is the most positive book in the world. It is a proclamation to humanity. It's a fountain of mercy and wisdom. It is a guide to the erring. It's a warning to the heedless. It's an assurance to those in doubt. It's a solace to the suffering. And it is a hope to those in display. The glorious Quran is a global necessity because it is the last and final revelation of the glorious Quran which was meant for the whole of humanity. It is a global necessity because it is the future world constitution. The Quran is a global necessity because it is the most positive book in the world. The Quran is a global necessity because it is a proclamation to humanity. The Quran is a global necessity because it is a fountain of mercy and wisdom. The Quran is a global necessity because it is a guide to the erring. The Quran is a global necessity because it's a warning to the heedless. The Quran is a global necessity because it is an assurance to those in doubt. The Quran is a global necessity because it is a solace to the suffering. The Quran is a global necessity because it is a hope to those in despair. Whenever you have a new machine or a new equipment, it is always accompanied by an instruction manual. If you allow me to call the human being a machine, you'd have to agree it is the most complicated machine on the face of the earth. It is more complicated than the most advanced computer in the world. Don't you think the human beings require instruction manual. The instruction manual for the human being is it is the glorious Quran. The glorious Quran is the instruction manual for the human being. The do's and don'ts for the human being is given in the glorious Quran. Because the glorious Quran is the instruction manual for the human being, it becomes a global necessity. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Mulk, chapter number 16, verse number 2, Alladhi khalaqal mawta wal hayata. It is Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. Have we ever thought, why are we here in this world? I would like to know how many of us, how many of us in this auditorium have ever thought, what is the purpose of our existence? What is the purpose of our life? Have we ever given it a thought that why have we come on the face of the earth? Can you raise your hand if you ever thought of this question? Okay, mashallah, about 10% 10, 10 of the people have thought of it. Good. We are here, we are living little less than 8 billion human beings in the world today. Close to 8 billion human beings in the world. Why are we here? What is the purpose of our life? Allah says in Surah Dhariya, chapter number 51, verse 56, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّةَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ We have created the men and the jinn not but to worship me. Our main purpose of this life is to worship our creator, our sustainer, our cherisher, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This topic, the Quran, a global necessity, 
is a very vast topic. And I have given hundreds of different lectures. And in every lecture, I quote the Quran, 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 chapter number, verse number. All the lectures can be part of this lecture. I have given a talk on what is the purpose of our lives, which is for about one and a half hour, with the question and session three hours. You should watch it. That why are we here? What is the purpose of our existence? Our purpose is to do ibadah of our creator, to worship our creator. When we obey his commandment, we are worshiping him. When we obey the guidelines given in the glorious Quran, we are worshiping him and we are fulfilling our purpose of creation. And I've given in detail in this talk that how people are mainly, they have different centers of life. Some are well-centered, some are society-centered, some are wealth-centered, some are fame-centered. But a Muslim should be Allah-centered. And for that, you have to follow the glorious Quran. Every human being should be centered around our creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It will not only benefit you in this world, it will benefit you in Akhra also. He should be Allah-centered. Time will not permit me to spend more time on this particular aspect. The definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is given in a nutshell in a beautiful surah, surah class, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4. This is the touchstone of theology. Theo means God, logi means study, theology means study of God. Surah class is the touchstone of theology. And this surah, it's only four verses. And a prophet said, it is equal to one third of the Quran. Means the message given in these four verses of Surah class is equivalent to the one third value of the Quran. And Allah says in this Quran, in this Surah, Kul Allah ahad. Say, He is Allah one and only. Allah samad. Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. There's nothing like him. This is a four-line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given in the glorious Quran. If any candidate claims him to himself to be God or Allah, if he fits in this four-line definition, we Muslims have no objection in accepting him as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the touchstone of theology. And this concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as I mentioned in the starting of my talk, that there were various revelations sent on the face of the earth to every nation. But the last and final is the glorious Quran. Because the earlier revelation, they were meant for a particular type of people, for a particular group of people, for a particular time period, Allah did not think it fit to preserve it. So besides the glorious Quran, all the previous revelation are not available in their pristine purity. But because Quran is last and final revelation, Allah says in Surah Hijr, chapter 15, verse number 9, that we have revealed the Quran and we shall guard it from corruption. In spite of the earlier revelations not being preserved in its pristine purity, yet when you do a comparative study of all the religions, you find that even if their scriptures have been altered, have been manipulated, have been concocted, yet the message of Tawheed is there in all the scriptures of the major religions. In the scriptures of all the major religions. And I've given a talk on concept of God in major world religions to prove that the basic message of all the religions is Tawheed. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64. Say, people of the book, come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah, na'buda illallah. 
that we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bhi shayyam, that we associate no partner with him. Wala yattakhid abad, dun abad, dun arbab and min Allah, that we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Fain tawallahu. If they turn back. Faqulu shadu. Say, I bear witness. We are Muslimun, that we are Muslims bowing over to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This verse of the glorious Quran, according to me, is the master key for da'wah. When you speak to the people of other faith, it says, Ta'ala ila kalimatin thawa'im bainan bainakum. Come to common terms as with us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. So main aim is to worship our one and only creator. And every human being in this world, it's my request to them. Whoever you feel is Almighty God, you put this God of yours to the test of Surah class. If he passes the test, he is the true God, otherwise he's a fake God. Let me give you an example. There are many people in the world who consider Bhagwan Rajnish to be God. You may have heard the name of Bhagwan Rajnish. He was from India, from Pune. Let's put this Bhagwan Rajnish to the test of Surah class. The first is, Kul Huwallahu Ahad. Say he's Allah one and only. Is Bhagwan Rajnish one and only? We know today there are thousands of men who are claiming to be God. He's not the only one. But the Rajnish Bhakti say, no, no, he's unique. Okay, let us go to the second test. Allah Samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. Was Rajnish absolute eternal? We know from his biography, he was suffering from asthma, from chronic backache, from diabetes mellitus. Imagine Almighty God suffering from asthma, from chronic backache, from diabetes mellitus. He begets not noisy begotten. We know Rajnish had parents who were born in Madhya Pradesh. Later on, his parents became his own disciple. And he leaves India and goes to America. And in the state of Oregon, he starts his own village called as Rajnishpuram. Later on, the American government arrests him and puts him behind bar. And then Rajnish alleges that in the prison, the US government gave him slow poisoning. Imagine Almighty God being slow poisoned. Later on, he's deported, he comes back to India. And in the city of Pune, he starts his new center called as Osho Commune. And when you go to Osho Commune, you will find on his samadhi mentioned there. Bhagwan Rajnish, never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December 1931 to the 30th of January 1990. They forgot to mention on his samadhi that he was he visiting the earth, he was not given visas to more than 30 different countries of the world. Imagine Almighty God coming to this world to visit the world and he requires visa to go to different countries. <laughs> and the last test, Walam there's nothing like him, is so stringent that no one besides Allah can pass. The moment you can compare God to anyone in this world, he's not God. Rajnish, we know, that he had two eyes, one nose, one mouth, one beard. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, he is not God. For example, someone says that Almighty God is a thousand times as strong as Arnold Schwarzenegger. You may have heard the name of Arnold Schwarzenegger, the person who got the title Mr. Universe. The strongest man in the world. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, whether it be Arnold Schwarzenegger, whether it be Dara Singh, whether it be King Kong, the moment you can, whether it's a thousand times or a million times. The moment you can compare Allah to anyone in this world, he's not Allah, he's not God. There's nothing like him. This formula given in the glorious Quran, the touchstone of theology to identify who are creators. I request all the human beings in the world, check up the God you're worshipping. If, if it passes the test of Surah class. He's a true God. If it fails, it's a fake God. This is the touchstone of theology. 
because Quran contains the touchstone of theology, the Quran is a global necessity to identify who is your creator, who is your sustainer, who is your cherisher. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 48, and Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 116, if Allah pleases, he may forgive any sin. But Allah will not forgive the sin of joining God with him. Allah says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 48, and Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 116, Allah will not forgive the sin of joining gods by associating partners with him. Any other sin, if he pleases, he may forgive. For anyone who has joined gods, anyone who has done shirk, he has created a heinous sin. He is straight far away. So the biggest sin in Islam, the biggest sin according to the Quran, is shirk associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with Almighty God. Allah says in Surah Hajj, chapter number 22, verse number 73, that all those who you worship besides God, all the idols, all the fake gods that you worship besides Allah, if all of them gather to create a fly, they will not be able to create. Leave aside creating a human being. The glorious Quran says, all those you worship besides the true God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if all of them gather together, they will not be able to create a fly. And the verse continues. The verse doesn't stop there. The verse continues. And if that fly takes away something from you, you will not be able to get it back. Leave aside create a fly. Allah is telling in the Quran, if that fly snatches something from you, a fly. If it snatches something, sits on your food and takes your food away, you can't even get it back. Feeble are those who petition, feeble are those to whom they petition. Weak are those people who invoke to other gods, and weak are those to whom they invoke. Because the Quran is giving you the formula to identify a creator, the Quran is the global necessity for every human being. You know, the doctors tell us that for a healthy body, you have to have three meals a day. Allah says in the Quran, for a spiritual body, for a spiritual mind, you have to offer salah five times a day. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 78, in Surah Taha chapter 20, verse number 130, and Surah Rum chapter number 30, verse number 17, 18, that the five times which is compulsory for the human beings to pray. Salah, the right translation is not prayer, because English is a deficient language. To pray means to ask for help, to beseech. In Salah, besides asking for help, we are being guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I prefer seeing it programming towards righteousness. Salah is a programming towards righteousness. And I've given another lecture on this topic, Salah, the programming towards righteousness. We are being programmed because a computer, you know, once it's programmed, it can be deprogrammed. There may be virus. But the human beings, when we keep on walking around the world, the evil we see around us, the wrong things we see around us, there are high chances we can get deprogrammed. So Allah tells, program yourself minimum five times a day. Fajr, that's the before sunrise. Zohar, after the sun is highest point. Asr, between highest point and, and at sunset. Maghrib, immediately after sunset. And when the night, when the light goes away, Isha, five times. After the Surah Fatiha, which is the guidance for us. The Imam may recite, Ya lidin amun, innam al khamru al maisuru. Oh, you believe most certainly in toxic and gambling. It's a Satan's handiwork. Abstain from it that you may prosper. We have been guided not to have alcohol, not to have pork, not to steal, not to rob, to be honest. It's a programming towards righteousness. 
It's keeping us human beings on the straight path. And I say, there is no appointment more important than the appointment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, when we have appointment with a VIP, with a minister, we are careful, we advance. You know, we, we come before time. If it's king, head of state, more before time. Allah is above all of these people. We can't afford to miss that appointment. Compulsory, five times a day. And yet, if you want to be closer, then you have the tahajjud. That's more closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For that, you can hear my talk, Salah, the programming towards righteousness. Allah says to us, it's compulsory for every Muslim that he should give 2.5% of his excess saving in charity. It's called a zakat. It's compulsory charity. If every rich human being in this world gives charity, poverty will be eradicated from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. If everyone gives zakat and follows this, there will be no poverty. Therefore, I say Quran is a global necessity to remove poverty. Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse 23, verse 183, fasting was prescribed to people who came before you. Fasting was prescribed to you as it was prescribed to people who came before you so that you may learn taqwa, you may learn God consciousness, you may learn piety. Today, the psychologists, they tell us, that if you can control your hunger, you can control almost all your desire. So we are being trained to control our desire by controlling hunger. Fasting is a training for us human beings to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to become more pious. And Ramadan, according to me, I say, it's the overhauling. As I said, if you consider a machine, if you have a vehicle like a motorcycle or a car, you have to keep on servicing it once in three months, once in six months. So I say Ramzan is servicing of the human body once a year. For one month. And scientific evidence has shown that if you abstain for about 12 hours a day for one month, there are various benefits. You can refer to my program. One of the largest talk I've given is Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zakir. It is of 32 episodes of 50 minutes each. It is for about 26 to 27 hours. Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zakir. Everything of that can be included in this talk, but time will not permit us. The best example of universal brotherhood is Hajj where Allah commands us in the glorious Quran that every adult Muslim who has the means and the health to perform, he should perform the pilgrimage to Hajj, to Makkah in the month of Hajj, at least once in his lifetime. It is the largest annual gathering of the world, where about 4 million people, except during COVID, it was reduced. But on average, before COVID, about three to four million people from all over the world, from USA, from Canada, from UK, from Pakistan, from India, from Oman, from different parts of the world, black, white, yellow, brown, they come and they're dressed up in two pieces of unsewn white cloth, the men. You cannot identify the person standing next to you as a king or a pauper. It's the best example of universal brotherhood. When you attend Hajj, your life is transformed. It's an example of what will happen on the day of Hashar. So the book that tells you at least once in a lifetime perform Hajj, this book becomes a global necessity. The criteria for going to Jannah is given in another beautiful short surah of the Quran, 
Surah Al Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, where Allah says, Wal Asr, by the token of time, Inna al insana la fi khusr, verily man is in a state of loss, is in khasara. Illa ladina amanu, except those who have faith. Wa amilu salihati, those who have righteous deed. Wa tawasaw bil haqqa, tawasaw bil sabr. Those who invite people to truth and those who invite people to patience and perseverance. This surah of the Quran, Surah Al-Asr, is telling that human being is in loss, except if you have four criteria. The only human being who will attain salvation, who will attain paradise, who will go to Jannah, is if they have these four basic criteria. Number one is Iman, having faith. Number two, Amal Salihat, the righteous deed. Number three, Watawasob al Haq, doing Dawa and Islah. And number four, Watawasob al Sabr, inviting people to patience and perseverance. Imam Shafi, may Allah be pleased with him, may Allah have mercy on him, he says that if only this surah, Surah Al Asr, was revealed, it would have been sufficient for the hidayah, for the guidance of humanity. Only if these four verses, only if these three verses of the Quran, Surah Asr, were revealed, according to Imam Shafi, may Allah have mercy on him, it would have been sufficient for the guidance of humanity. And when we analyze, you pick up any verse of the Quran, these verses of the Quran will invariably fall in one of these four criteria. Either it will be Iman, it will either be Amal Salihat, Either watawasaw bil haqq or watawasaw bil sabr. This is the beauty of the Quran. So imagine the book which is giving you rahin jat, the path to salvation, the path to Jannah, this book has to be a global necessity. Therefore I say, the Quran is a global necessity because it is the instruction manual for humankind. It is a global necessity because it says this life is a test for the hereafter. It's a global necessity because it shows you the purpose of your life. To worship none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran is a global necessity because it tells you the definition and how to identify our creator and sustain Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran is a global necessity because it shows you a formula how to stay on the straight path by offering salah. The Quran is a global necessity because it shows you a way how to eradicate poverty by giving zakat. The Quran is a global necessity because it shows you a way how to overhaul your body, how to attain taqwa by fasting in the month of Ramadan. The Quran is a global necessity because it shows you a practical way of universal brotherhood and understanding our creator by performing hajj. The Quran is a global necessity because it shows you the path to salvation, the path to Jannah. <clears throat> there are various reasons, hundreds or rather thousands, why I would say the Quran is a global necessity. Time will not permit. I'm only giving you highlights, not even scratching the surface. And for each point, there can be a lecture of one to two hours. The other important factor that Quran is a global necessity is because it is the solution for the problems of humankind. And I've given a talk on Islam, the solution for the problem of humankind. Now, if you want to know how to solve a problem, suppose a machine doesn't know it's, it is malfunctioning, or the machine is spoiled, who is the best person who can solve the problem of the machine? Who is the best person who 
can see to it that the machine functions back to normal? Who? The creator, the manufacturer, the inventor. The creator, the manufacturer, the inventor. We Muslim call him as Allah. So the best solution for the problems of humanity can only be given by the creator of the human beings. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the glorious Quran is the last and final revelation of, the, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I've given a talk. Is the Quran God's word proving that the Quran is God's word? That again is a two and a half hour lecture. That was one of my longest lecture in any public gathering in Malaysia, where the talk was for two and a half hours with question and session. It was for about six and a half hours. It started after Isha, went on till Fajr. So the Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the best book that can give you solution. It has solution for the problems of humankind. It has solution to racism. Allah says in Surah Hujura, chapter 49, verse number 13, Ya ayyuhan nasu inna khalaqnaakum min zakin wa unsa wa jalnaakum shau ma wa qaba ila li ta'rafu inna ka mukmin da Allah yatkaakum inna Allah alimun khabir O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other not that you shall despise each other from this verse of the Quran, Allah tells us, we have been created from one single pair. We have common great, 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 great grandparents. And Allah has divided us into nations and tribes, black and white, yellow and brown. Not that you shall despise each other, so that you shall recognize each other. And Allah says the criteria for judgment in the sight of Allah, it's not wealth, it's not color, it's not caste, it's not sex. It is taqwa. It is righteousness. It is God consciousness. It is piety. The only way one human being can be superior to other is not by wealth in the sight of Allah. It's not by age. It's not by color. It is with taqwa. It is with God consciousness. It is with piety. That's the reason I say Quran is a global necessity. It's hope to everyone. Otherwise, the poor man will think what person is rich, he'll be closer to Allah. Nowhere does Allah say rich man is closer. In fact, it's more difficult for a rich man to go to Jannah than a poor man, Allah says. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, a rich man will be questioned more. Did he give his zakat? Did he do his duty? A poor man, no zakat. 100 out of 100. In that aspect, we say, Garib Admi, a poor man. Actually, in the question of zakat, he gets 100 out of 100 because he doesn't have to give zakat. For the rich man, some may give proper, some may give half, some may not give at all. So that's the reason a prophet said it is more difficult for a rich man to enter Jannah than a poor man. So imagine this Quran has the solution to the problem of racism. The Quran has the solution to the problem of terrorism and murder. Allah says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, if anyone kills any other human being, whether it be Muslim or non-Muslim, unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. There is no religious scripture I know of which says that if you kill one innocent human being, you have killed the whole of humanity. And the Quran does not stop there. Quran continues that if anyone saves any other human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, it is as though you have saved the whole nation. This is the solution for terrorism and for murder. And the world is saying Muslims are terrorists. And after 9-11, there was a very famous saying against the Muslim that every Muslim is not a terrorist, but every terrorist is a Muslim. And in reply to that, in 2006, I gave a talk, is terrorism a Muslim monopoly? And I've given statistics on terrorism, who did the first hijack of the plane, who did the first assassination, and in the last 50 years, 100 years, what is noted, you can Google and search, almost all have been non-Muslims. So where are you talking about Muslims? So you should hear my talk, is terrorism a Muslim monopoly? Quran has the solution 
for the problem of terrorism. But when they cannot prove the Quran wrong, so they say, Quran promotes terrorism. When they cannot prove Zakir wrong, Zakir Naik wrong in India, they say he's promoting terrorism. I've been invited in India to give talks in the academy, in the police academy in Hyderabad, many times. You know, all the IGP, Inspector General. I used to give them talks on counter-terrorism. There in London, in many of the Gulf countries. In many countries, they called me to give talks on anti-terrorism. And now, the new government is laying allegation that I promote terrorism. Alhamdulillah, when the judge in India court says, you know, when they wanted to attach all my properties, the judge was a Sikh, Manmohan Singh, and fortunately, he had seen many of my talks. He said to the lawyer of the government, you point out one statement of Dr. Zakir Naik in context in any lecture where he promotes terrorism, I will attach all his properties. The problem is I do not attack other religions. I use the formula of the Quran, come to common terms as between us and you. So when I talk about similarities between Islam and Hinduism, Islam and Christianity, the people can't digest it. People are coming close to the deen. When I talk about the Quran, which is the global necessity, they fall in love with the Quran. Even today when I'm traveling, I've done hijrah from India to Malaysia, seven years back. When I meet non-Muslims outside, the Hindu, they say, we apologize on behalf of my government. Can we take a selfie with you? Some Muslim may get scared to take photo. But the non-Muslims, they want to take photo with me. Talking about the Indians. So what they do when they cannot attack the Quran, Delhi allegations against the Quran, and I've given a talk on Islam, the solution to the problems of humanity, and how they malign using media. Time will not permit me to go in details. But as I said, Quran has the solution for terrorism and murder. Quran has a solution to injustice and inequality. Allah says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 135. Ya you allazina amun, oh you believe, stand out for truth as witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it be against yourself, against your parents, against the rich or poor. Allah says, when you have to be witness, always stand for truth, even if it be against you. Even if it be against your parents or your relatives. Even if it's against the rich and the poor. When I read this verse, you know, in the beginning of my dawah, dawah life, I could understand the Quran saying, if it's against yourself, okay, fine. If it's against your parents, against the rich, what does Quran mean by against the poor? Why would someone give falsehood for being against the poor? Against the rich, yes, we benefit, he may give you money. The parents may benefit us. But what does the Quran mean by saying against the poor? What does Allah mean that for the haq, you have to be on the irrespective rich You cannot say, oh, the man is poor man. If I give witness against him, he'll lose his job. Even if he's poor, you cannot. That is Allah's prerogative. If you have to give witness, if he's done a crime, you have to give witness against him. You cannot say, I've seen him robbing, but if I give witness, he will lose his job, so I will give a false witness. 
So you have to be on the haq, whether the person is rich or poor. This will remove the inequality and injustice. Quran has the solution to the problem of alcoholism and drug addiction. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 90, Ya ayyuhalladhina amunu, O you believe, innam al khamru al maithuru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling. Wa anzabu al aslamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rishthum minam li shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork, fashtanibu la lukum tuflihun, abstain from the handiwork that you may prosper. You know, my colleagues, they say alcoholism is a disease. I say, if it's a disease, it's the only disease that is sold in bottles. If it's a disease, it's the only disease which has no viral or germ cause. If it's a disease, it's the only disease that advertised in the newspapers and channels. It's the only disease that gets a revenue for the government. It's the only disease that causes violent deaths on the highway. It's the only disease that disrupts the family. Allah gives the answer. It's not a disease. It's a Satan handiwork. First, abstain from the handiwork that may prosper. So Quran has the solution for the problem of alcoholism and drug addiction. Imagine our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 1400 years ago when he recited this verse and he said, Alcoholism was prevalent there. Very common. The Sahabas, they emptied the drums of alcohol on the streets of Medina, never to be filled again. Who can do that? America tried decades earlier to stop alcohol. They could not. The economy went down. It is our creator who tells you how to solve your problems. Therefore, I say, Quran is a global necessity it is the only book which has the solution for the problem of alcoholism and drug addiction. Quran has the solution for prostitution, for fornication, for adultery. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 31, Come not close to adultery, for it is an evil opening other roads to evil. Zina is an evil opening other roads to evil. Quran has a solution for the immodesty, for the nudity, for the pornography. Quran prescribes a system of hijab. Normally people talk for hijab for the female. Allah first talks for the hijab for the male in the Quran, then for the female. Allah says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30, Say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. Whenever a man looks at a woman in any brazen thought, any unashamed thought comes in his mind, he should lower his gaze. Once there was a young Muslim who was staring at a girl for a long time. I said, brother, what are you doing? It's not allowed in Islam. He told me, our beloved prophet said, the first glance is allowed, the second is prohibited. I have not completed half my glance. What did the Prophet mean when he said the first glance is, for, is forgiven, the second is prohibited? That means he meant if you by mistake look at a woman, lower your gaze, it's forgiven. That doesn't mean you can stare at a woman without blinking for 10 minutes and saying, I have not completed my glance. The next verse speaks about the hijab for the woman. Allah says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31, say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty. And display not her beauty except what appears ordinary of. And draw her veil over the bosom. Except in front of her father, her sons, her husband. And a big list of mehram is given. And the criteria for hijab is given more in detail in the other verses of Surah Azab, chapter, 39, chapter 33, verse 59. And in the Hadith of the Prophet. There are basically six criteria for hijab. The first is that the complete body it should be covered. The extent. For the man, it's from the navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered except the hands, the face, and the hands up to the wrist. Some people say even the face should be covered. Second is the clothes should not be so tight-fitting, it reveals the figure. Third, it should not be translucent or transparent so that you can see through. 
Fourth, it should not be glamorous so that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. And sixth, it should not resemble that of the unbeliever. These are basically six criteria for hijab. And I always give the example that if there are two twin sisters who are very beautiful, equally beautiful, if they are walking down the streets of Muscat, one is wearing the Islamic hijab, complete body covered, except the face and hands up to wrist, and the other twin sister, she's wearing the western clothes, maybe low neck, skirt, and if round the corner there is a hooligan who's waiting for a catch, who's waiting to tease a girl. I know in Oman it's very rare. It's more common in the Western world. Because the law is strict. But if a person is waiting to tease a girl, waiting for a catch, which girl will he tease? Will he tease the girl wearing the Islamic hijab or will he tease the girl wearing the Western clothes? Who will he tease? Which one? Western clothes. You don't have to be a scholar for that. It's a simple question. You don't receive an award. You invite and you get it. Once in Dubai, when I was giving a talk, in Dubai, maybe a few years back, an audience of about 30,000 people, one non-Muslim girl, during question and answer time, she came and said, Dr. Zakir, I've heard your talk. And you said, giving the example of twin sisters, who will you tease? According to me, the person wearing the Islamic hijab will be teased. You know why? Because the person likes, would like to know what is behind the clothes. <laughs> and my daughter in the audience said, now Abba is trapped. My daughter says, because you know, we don't expect this. We know it's an illogical answer, but a dai should be trained. A dai should be trained in how to reply illogical questions. So I got up and I said that a sister has asked a question. I don't agree with her answer. I don't agree with her reply. She said that the girl in the hijab would be teased because they would like to know what is behind the clothes. I don't agree with her. But if she really agrees with the answer, then why is she wearing clothes? She should remove the clothes. And she was embarrassed. The battle was won. I told her, if you believe... <laughs> believe me, I've been in the field of Dawa for, mashallah, more than 30 years. This is the first time after 20... 325 years, somebody is posing me this question. I was shocked, but Allah helps us. So, she was so embarrassed that she walked away because she knew. She knew she was asking, uh, giving a wrong reply. I said, if you really believe in this, why are you wearing clothes? Do you want to be teased? So, Islam has the solution to the problem of nudity, to the problem of pornography, to the problem of obscenity. Today we have, in most of the ads, we have ladies. Why? For motorcycle, you have a lady. For car, you have a lady. How many, how many ladies have motorcycle? Percentage very small. They want to sell our daughters. They want to sell our mothers. In a very famous ad, I was told in, the, in, a, in a very famous BMW ad, there's a lady who's standing in front of the car in the bikinis, and the ad reads, test drive her now. <laughs> Who, the girl or the car? <laughs> what is the Western world doing? They are selling our daughters, they are selling their mothers, they are selling their sisters. Islam prohibits making a one-term show of the female. We love our daughters, our mothers, our wives. We respect them. That's the reason we care for them. They asked me the question, why should a woman require a mehram? I said, why does your president require so many guards? Your president requires guards, our women require mehram. So every question has a reply. And the solution, 
the solution to the problems of humanity is in the glorious Quran. Therefore, I say it is a global necessity. Quran has the solution to the economic problem. Today, the major economic problem is because of riba, controlled by a handful of people in the world. The full economy of the world is controlled by a handful of people. Rockefeller, I don't want to name them. They control the banking system, riba. Quran has a solution for riba. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 278 and 279, if you give up not your demands of riba, demands of interest, take notice of a war from Allah and His Rasul. Allah says, if you give up not your demands of riba, Allah and His Rasul will wage a war against you. Now, who has the courage? Who has the guts? Who has the ability to fight with Allah and His Rasul? Riba is the twelfth major sin according to Imam al dhabi in his book of Qabair. It is a problem for many. It is the biggest problem of many things in this world. Financing gambling den, financing alcohol. It makes a rich man more rich and a poor man more poor. I've given a talk on interest-free economy promulgated by the Quran. Time will not permit. But Quran has a solution to the economic problem of the world by eliminating riba. Quran has a problem of corruption. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 188, that use not your wealth as bait for judges in order that you may eat other people's wealth. Bribing and corruption is haram in Islam. Therefore, I say that Quran is a global necessity. Quran has the solution to the problems of humanity. Because Quran is a book written by creator who's the only one who can give the best solution for humanity, for the human problems. Quran is a global necessity because it has the solution to the problem of racism, the problem of terrorism, the problem of inequality and injustice. Quran is a global necessity because it has the solution for alcoholism and drug addiction. It has the solution for the prostitution, fornication, adultery. It has the solution for immodesty, for nudity and pornography. It has the solution for the economic problems. It has the solution to the corruption in this world. And if you analyze, time will not permit me to go into details. If you analyze, Quran has the solution to all your problems, whether it be at your individual level, whether it be at your family level, whether it be at the level of society, whether it be the level of your nation, whether it be a global level. Quran has the solution to all your problems, whether it be social problem, whether it be economical problem, whether it be political problem, whether it be environmental problem, whether it be psychological problem. Quran has the solution to the problems of humanity. This Quran is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it has proved itself to be the word of God in all the ages. Previously, it was the age of miracles. That is the reason we find that the earlier prophets did miracles. Musa alayhi salam parting of sea, Isa alayhi salam giving life to the dead. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam did many miracles, but we normally boast about the Quran, which is the miracle of miracle. It is the only miracle which can be tested now. The miracle done by the earlier prophet, you cannot go back in time and test it. Whether did Moses, peace be upon him, parted the sea or not? Did Isa alayhi salam give life to the dead or not? Quran says we believe. But can we go back and test? No. Quran today is a living miracle. It is the miracle of miracles. And I've given the talk, is the Quran God's word? And I've showed various ways, various ways, how you can prove the Quran wrong. 
Quran, Allah tells you, if you want to prove it wrong, do so and so. Allah says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 2, أَفَلَا يَذَدَبْرُونَ الْقُرَانَ وَلَوْ قَانَ مِنْ دِي غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوْ جُدِ فِيكْتِ لَفَنْ كَسْغِرَا Do they not consider the Quran with care? Do they not ponder over the Quran with care? Had it been from anyone besides Allah, there have been many contradictions. Allah is telling you, take out only one contradiction from the Quran, and Quran would be proved wrong. No one has been able to do that. The Quran is a living miracle. Later on came the age of literature and poetry. Muslim and non-Muslim Arabic scholar alike, they agree, Quran is the best Arabic book on the face of the earth. And when the Quran was revealed, Arabic was at its peak, at its pinnacle. Today, very few people, handful who can really know the Logos of Allah. When the Quran was revealed, Arabic was at its peak and the Arabs were proud about the language. So Allah in this age gives the challenge to the Arabic who are proud of the Arabic language. Allah says in Surah Isra chapter number 17 verse number 88, that if all of you gather together, the men and the jinn, and try to produce the Quran, you will not be able to do it. Allah repeats the message in Surah Tur chapter number 52 verse number 34, that do you say the Quran is forged? He challenge you to produce a recital like the Quran. Then Allah makes the challenge easier. Allah says in Surah Hud chapter number 11, verse number 13, that do you say Quran is forged? Produce 10 surahs like the Quran. Forget the full Quran. Produce 10 surahs like the Quran. And no one did it. Allah makes the challenge easier. In Surah Yunus chapter number 10, verse number 38, do you say the Quran is forged? Produce one surah. Like the Quran. No one could do it. Allah makes the challenge more easier. And I started my today's talk with this challenge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 23 and 24. وَإِنْكُنْتُمْ <laughs> Allah says, and if you are in doubt as what we have produced to a servant from time to time, if you are in doubt as what we have revealed to our servant Prophet Muhammad from time to time, then produce, produce a surah somewhat similar, mimmisli. Not misli, mim misli. That means Allah is saying, forget about one surah like the Quran. One surah somewhat similar like the Quran. You will not be. And call forth your helpers. Besides Allah. All the helpers in the world, mankind, jinn, put together. Besides Allah, try and produce one surah. And the shortest surah in the Quran is only three words. Only ten words. Ten words only. Try and produce 10 words somewhat similar to the Quran. Mimmisli. If you are truthful, Allah can do you. Failam tafalu. And if you cannot, walam tafalu. And of a surety you cannot. Then fear the fire which is prepared for those who are fasic people, who are rejectors, whose fuel shall be men and stone. So Allah is giving a challenge, you will not be able to do it. And you will never be able to do it. Imagine at that time, when Arabic was its peak, when the poets, who were, when they read the verse of the Quran, many of them accepted Islam. This cannot be from a human being. The way it is, the way the words are, they can't be human beings because they were on the highest level. So this is called as a falsification test. A falsification test meaning, you see, for Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein, when he propounded his theory of relativity, along with it, he gave you three ways how to prove the theory wrong. That means it is worth considering. So Allah gives you many ways how to prove the Quran wrong. Produce one surah, it will be proved wrong. Take out one contradiction, it will be proved wrong. At that time, Allah says, talking 
about Abu Lahab, who was one of the staunchest enemy of Islam. He used to always speak against the Prophet. If the Prophet said white, if the Prophet said day, he used to say night. Prophet said black, he used to say white. And Allah reveals the surah, surah Lahab, saying this person, he will burn in hell. Now, only thing Abu Lahab had to do to prove the Quran wrong was make one more lie. Say, I'm a Muslim. Only one more lie he says, only for namesake. Not that they had to believe in Allah. He had to say one more lie, I'm a Muslim for namesake. And the Quran would have been proved wrong. But Allah, our creator, knows that. He will not say it. Yet 10 years after the Quran was revealed, to just say one more lie, I'm a Muslim, and khalas, the Quran would have been proved wrong. He did not do it, he could not do it. Allah talks about the Jews. That Jews will never say, call, the Jews will never be. Allah says that among the Ali Kitab, those who say they are Nasara Christians, they are better than the Yahud. If the Jews want to prove the Quran wrong, even today they can do what they can do. All the Jews in the world say, okay, for next five years, we'll be better than the Christian to the Muslims. Today, the Jews can prove the Quran wrong. If they get together and say, we'll be better than the Christians to the Muslims, the Quran is proved wrong. It's an open challenge. They cannot do it. If you hear my full talk, is the Quran God's word? There are many falsification tests. Time will not permit me to speak about it. Time is running short. But today is not the age of literature and poetry. Today, if a very poetic book says the world is flat, will a modern man believe in it? And the answer is no. Because today is the age of science and technology. And I've given a talk, Quran and modern science. And I've proved that Quran, in the Quran, the Quran is not a book of science. S-C-I-E-N-C-E, -E, but it's a book of signs, S-I-G-N-S. It's a book of ayats. There are more than 6,000 ayats, signs in the Quran, out of which more than 1,000 speak about signs. And there are hundreds of scientific facts mentioned in the Quran, which wasn't known when the Quran was revealed 14 years ago. And I've given a full talk about the shape of the earth, about the creation of the universe, about the Big Bang, about the sun having its own light, moon not having its own light, and the sun and the moon rotating, and the fourth state of matter, on and on about the universe, about botany, about zoology, about embryology, the plants having sexes, and talking about zoology, about the lifestyle of the ants, lifestyle of the spider, about embryology, and on and on and on and on. And if you analyze with today's science and technology, any scripture of the world today, all will fail except the glorious Quran. It's a challenge. So the Quran has proved itself to be the word of God in all the ages. Therefore, I say the Quran is a global necessity. It has proved itself to be the word of God. The Quran is a global necessity because it is a miracle of miracles. It has various falsification tests and no one has been able to prove it wrong. The Quran is the only religious book on the face of the earth which can stand the test of science and technology. The Quran is far ahead. There are many things which science hasn't discovered which the Quran mentions. Maybe they'll discover 20 years later, 100 years later, Allah alam. The Quran has the solution to the problems of humanity. And the Quran, the Quran, whoever touches it, whoever gets involved in it, it becomes the best. For example, the month in which the Quran was revealed is Ramadan, it is the best month of the year. The night in which the Quran was revealed, Laylatul Qadr, Allah says it is the best night equivalent to 
a thousand nights, about more than 80 years. The month revealed is the best month. The night it was revealed is the best night. The prophet to whom it was revealed, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's the best prophet. <laughs> the angel, the angel who brought the revelation from Allah to the prophet, Archangel Gabriel, he's the best angel. <laughs> the people to whom the Quran was revealed, Allah says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 110, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat linnas. Oh, ye Muslims, ye are the best of peoples of all for mankind. Because Allah says in the Quran, ye Muslims are the best of peoples of all for mankind. Why? Because we enjoin what is good and we forbid what is wrong and we believe in Allah. Before in my talk, it is a request to my brothers and sisters, whether they're Muslims or non-Muslims, you owe it to yourself. You have to read the Quran in the language you understand the best. The Quran is a global necessity. That's the reason all the other scriptures in the world, all the other scriptures, they are revealed in dead languages. Whether it be Sanskrit, whether it be Aramaic, whether it be Greek, whether it be the Bible, whether it be the Veda, they are dead languages, only a handful know about it. But the Quranic Arabic language is a live language. If you can understand Arabic as a language, it is the best. If you know Lugafu said the best, if you don't understand Arabic as a language, read it in the language you understand the best. If you know English, read the English translation of the Quran. If you know Urdu, read the Urdu translation of the Quran. If you know Hindi, read the Hindi translation of the Quran. If you know Chinese, read the Chinese translation of the Quran. Read the translation of the Quran in the language you understand the best. Inshallah, it will touch your life, it will change your life, it will transform your life. If you meet the people who are attached with the Quran, the life is different. The world will not be able to change you. I don't claim that I'm a very pious person, but my life is attached to the Quran. I don't claim I follow 100%. I try my level best. And because I'm attached to the Quran, I have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we all Muslims have faith. Whatever happens, happens for the best. And if we follow the guidelines of the Quran, your life has to be transformed. You can only get peace in this world, not by wealth, not by power, not by fame. Only peace and tranquility is by understanding and coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the only way you can do that is with the help of the Quran. And Quran says, Atiullah, Ati Rasul. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. So if you're close to the Quran, you have to be close to the things and teachings of a Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They are knit together. And if you read the Quran, and if you follow the guidance of the Quran, and the teachings of the last and final Messenger, and follow the authentic Hadith, your life has to be transformed. If Allah is with you, you don't require anyone else. And this goes on for every human being on the face of the earth, whether you're a Muslim or a non-Muslim. And I request even my non-Muslim brothers and sisters that you owe it to yourself. At least read the Quran once in your lifetime with understanding. You will fall in love with the Quran. You read the second time, the third time. Normally, most of the books you can read only once. Some books you can read twice, thrice, four times. But the Quran, the more you read it, the more you fall in love with it. The more you read it, the more you understand it. If you read a thousand times, when you read it a thousand and first time, you enjoy it more. And the peace and serenity that you get, the verses of the Quran has a solution to the problems of humanity. Whatever happens in this world, and and the Quran says, 
you know, I was a medical doctor, you know my background, that I chose to become a doctor because I thought it was the best profession. It is a good profession. But when I got influenced by Sheikh Ahmed Didad, the person who inspired me, and when I came closer to the Quran, Quran says in Surah Fusilla, chapter number 41, verse number 33, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَالَ مِنْ مَنْ ضَوِيلَ اللَّهِ وَعَمِلُ صَالِحًا قَالَ إِنَّ نِمْلَ مِسْلِمِينَ Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, works righteousness, and says that I'm a Muslim? So the best profession according to the Quran is of a day. And people who know my background, during childhood I was a stammerer. And if you ask, what is your name? My name is Zah, 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 Zakir. When I was inspired by Sheikh Ahmed Didad, when I started doing Dawa with the non-Muslims, my stammering vanished. When I spoke with Muslims, again my stammering came. One day I went on the stage, I spoke fluently. A normal man difficult to speak fluently. In my dreams, I could have dreamt of becoming the best doctor in the world, possible. I could not have dreamt of speaking in front of 25 people. With Allah's help, I'm speaking in front of thousands of people, 100,000, 1 million people. Miracle. It is the miracle of the Quran. It is the miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if I would have been the best doctor in the world, I would not have so many people coming for my talk. Allah has blessed me. We did for Allah. We have met most of the heads of states of the Muslim countries, the top people, large audiences. We didn't do it for fame. But Allah gives you part and parcel. The Prophet Muhammad is the best example. He didn't do for fame. He was the most famous personality in the world. And even the most person who's attacked in the world. The most famous personality in the world is Muhammad and the maximum books against who? Against any human being in the world is the Prophet. Every day more than one book is written against the Prophet according to Time magazine. 60,000 in a span of 150 years. If you calculate, more than one book written against the Prophet every day. But what the Prophet has done, we are nothing. So we get inspiration from the Prophet. We get inspiration. And when Allah is with you, believe me, when the Quran is your guide, you are strong. And Allah says in Surah Furqan, chapter number 24, verse number 30, that always along with the Prophet, there will be an enemy. That means there will be people who are against the Prophet. So if you're a dai, if you're a dai that is speaking on the right track and following the Quran, there are bound to be people who will be against you. If no one is against you, then maybe your direction is not correct. Because for the Prophet, Allah says in the Quran, we have, there'll be enemies always against the Prophet. So the Quran, it is a global necessity. If the Quran is your guide, make Quran as your main guide in this life. If Quran is your guide, believe me, you'll have the best of serenity, best of peace, the best of tranquility. I would like to end my talk with the quotation of the glorious Quran from Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81, 82. Allah says, وَقُلْ جَالْ حَقْ وَذَاقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلِ كَانَ زَوْكَ وَنُوا نَزُّلْ مِنُوا الْقُرَانِ وَشِفَى That when truth is hurled against falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. The Quran is a healing for the believers, but for those, the transgressors, unbelievers, it is nothing but loss and loss. وَآخِرُ الدَّوَانَ الْحَمْدُ لَيْهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Jazakallah khair, uh, Dr. Zakhir Naik, for the wonderful talk today. I believe it was uh, a good talk that we all uh, needed. Now it's time for the question and answer session. 
But before that, uh, Doctor, we have uh, two sisters who would like to take shahada, inshallah. Uh. Can I ask uh, from the two sisters to come to the mic there? Would like to talk to them? Yes, they are there. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa sister. Uh, I'm told that uh, the two sisters would like to give the shahada. <laughs> One sister. Doctor, sir, we Urdu mein baat karenge, ya Hindi mein. Oh, you speak Hindi. Okay, fine. Apka naam kya bhen? Mera naam Arti hai. Sorry. Arti. Apka naam? Mera naam Arti hai. Arti hai. Sister, she is Arti. I want to ask you that what you believe is that God is one? Yes. Do you believe that God is not one of the people who are not one of the people? Yes. Do you believe that God is wrong? Yes. Do you believe that the last prayer of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is? Yes. I'm just asking a question in Hindi that do you agree that there's only one God? She says yes. Do you agree that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah? And then she said yes. I asked her that do you believe that idol worship is wrong? And she said yes. Then I asked her that do you believe that Prophet Muhammad is the last and final messenger? And she said yes. Ben, you want to do Islam with your own اسلام قبول کرنے کے لیے دو شرط ہیں کم از کم منیمم ایک ہے کہ ماننا چاہے کہ اللہ کے علاوہ کوئی معبود نہیں ہے صرف اللہ کی عبادت کرنا چاہے اور دوسرا ہے کہ محمد صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم اللہ کے آخری پیغمبر ہے اگر یہ دو چیز میں آپ مانتے ہیں منیمم تو آپ مسلم بن سکتے ہیں آپ کو کوئی آپ اپنی مرضی سے اسلام قبول کرنا چاہتی ہے آپ پہ کوئی بھی زبردستی کر رہا ہے نا Do you want to give a gift to you? No. I'm asking the sister that are you willingly accepting Islam? She said yes. Is anyone forcing you to accept Islam? She said no. I said is anyone bribing you to accept Islam? She said no. So inshallah, I'll say in Arabic and you can speak to her. Ashadu. Aslu. Allah. Allah. Ilaha. Illallah. 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 Wa ashadu. Wa ashadu. Washadu Washadu Anna Anna Muhammadan Muhammadan Abduhu Abhu Varasuluhu 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 I May shahadat deti hoon May shahadat deti hoon May shahadat deti hoon Ke Allah ke ilawa Allah ke ilawa Koi bhi maabud nahi hai Koi bhi maabud nahi hai Or Or Muhammad Muhammad Sallallah Sallallah Alayhi wa sallam Allah muslim اس کے پیغمبر اس کے پیغمبر اور نبی ہے اور نبی اور نبی ہے ماشاءاللہ آپ مسلمان ہو چکے اللہ آپ کو جدہ خیر دے میں اللہ سے دعا کرتا ہوں اور اللہ کے رسول فرماتے کہ جب کوئی بھی اسلام قبول کرتا ہے غیر مسلم اس کے سارے گناہ معاف ہو جاتے ہیں تو آج آپ معصوم ہیں you are sinless اور میں اللہ سے دعا کرتا ہوں میں اللہ سے دعا کرتا ہوں کہ اللہ آپ کو جنت فردوس دے اور میں دعا کرتا ہوں کہ آپ ذریعہ بنے آپ کے فیملی آپ کے خاندان والوں کو بھی صحیح راستے پر لکھے اور میں دعا کرتا ہوں کہ آپ اپنے باقی جو باقی سہلیاں ہیں اور آپ کے فرنڈ سکلے ان کو بھی صحیح راستے پر لے گئے 
ان شاء الله جزاك الله شكرا ڈاکٹر صاحب السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ تعالی وبرکاتہ ان کی سسٹر ہیں جو 2 ایئرز پہلے ہی یہاں عمان میں اسلام قبول کی ہیں وہ کچھ پوچھنا چاہتی ہیں اپ سے یہ بڑی سسٹر ہیں اور یہ ان کی چھوٹی سسٹر تھیں جو انڈیا سے لے کر آئی ہیں ابھی ضرور السلام علیکم وعلیکم السلام ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ ڈاکٹر صاحب یہ کہہ رہی ہیں کہ آپ ان سے پوچھیں کہ آپ اسلام قبول کرنے کے بعد کیسا فیل کرتی ہیں اور ان کی سسٹر نے جو ہے انہوں نے اپنی سسٹر کو دعوت دی اور وہ آج ماشاء اللہ بھی اسلام قبول کی ہیں تو وہ کہہ رہی ہیں کہ آپ مجھ سے کچھ ایسا کوشچن پوچھنا چاہتے ہیں جی السلام علیکم وعلیکم السلام و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ جی آپ پوچھیے کچھ سوری آپ کہہ رہے تھے کہ آپ کی بہن نے بھی اسلام قبول کیا جی جی ماشاء اللہ جی میرا ابھی ایک سال ہو گیا میں اسلام قبول کی ہوں ماشاء اللہ جی تو ابھی بہن کو بھی اسلام میں لائی ماشاء اللہ ان کو جزائے خیر دے اور ہم دعا کرتے ہیں کہ اللہ تعالیٰ ان کو بھی جانتے فردوس فرمائے جی جی آمین آمین آپ کا کوئی بھی سوال ہے ان کے بہاف کے اوپر آپ کو کوئی سوال پوچھنے کا اپنے بہن کے ذریعے سے کیا سوال پوچھ رہے ہیں جی جی نماز کے لیے مجھے نہیں آ رہا میں کیا بولا انشاءاللہ ہم دعا کرتے ہیں کہ اللہ تعالیٰ سے کہ آپ اور آپ کی بہن کو انشاءاللہ شاء جنت فردوس فرمائیں اور اور آپ کے ذریعے انشاءاللہ اور لوگ کو اسلام کے سیدھے راستے پہ لے کے جزاک اللہ شکر How many, how much do you have time? So uh, it's time for question and answers. I have just few guidelines for you guys. Uh, the first one is if you may please give priority to ask questions to our non-Muslim uh, brothers and sisters. I hope some of them today uh, joined uh, today's lecture. Um, the question can be about today's topic and anything that related to Islam, they can ask uh, Dr. Zakir. Um, please only ask one question at a time, so more people can ask questions. Also, um, we will take one question from the sister's side and one question from the brother's side, so to give equal opportunity. There are uh, mics there for the brothers, and there is mic there for the sisters, yeah? So anyone who wants to pose a question, Please come to the mic. For the brother's side, is there. Anyone who has a question to come to the mic. And anyone who has a question from the sister's side to come to the mic. We'll start with the brothers. Please again make sure that you ask one question And please, please do not give another lecture, yeah? Just the question, please. Yes, please, go ahead. As-salamu alaykum. Uh, as the, brothers, as the, the coordinator mentioned, that we'd first request if there are any questions from the non-Muslims. You know, the non-Muslims are our guest of honor today. So if there are any questions from the non-Muslims, you're most welcome to ask first. This is the opportunity. I'm young, I can take it. You can ask any questions. Even if it's attacking Islam, attacking me, attacking the Quran, inshallah, I'll try my level best to reply to the best of my ability. <laughs> Normally, after a religious talk, you don't have question-answer sessions, you know, because in the question-answer session, you can be exposed. <coughs> Here we like it. We know we are on the haq, and we know Quran is on the haq. So if there are any non-Muslim who'd like to ask any questions, whether you agree with me or disagree with me, this is the opportunity. We'd like to give the first opportunity to our non-Muslim brothers and sisters. If there are any non-Muslim who like to ask a question, they can break the queue. Yes, brother, most welcome. Any non-Muslim brother? 
Is there any non-Muslim sister would like to ask a question? <laughs> there may be some non-Muslim may be shy to ask questions. Normally, when we organize in India, as I told you, we have twenty percent non-Muslim. Yes, Mashallah. Can can we have from our organizer maybe a mic there, or it will be too far? If you can even keep wow. one more microphone on the top, if possible. Yeah. Or oh, there's one microphone here. Yeah. He have chosen the closest <laughs> place to be in. <laughs> it's fine. They will have another mic. <laughs> okay. Maybe meanwhile we take a question from the. Can someone give a microphone on the top on the second floor? It would have been better if one microphone was placed on each floor. That should be a very, very good question, huh? <laughs> and a shahada, inshallah. <laughs> Yes, we have someone there. Yeah, we'll, we'll take it there. Okay. I will give to one of the organizers. Thank you. Uh, Ramadan Mubarak, uh, Dr. Nayak, I consider this my a great Ramadan gift, the opportunity of seeing you in flesh and blood after 15 years of watching so many of your shows on YouTube. It's a real honor, sir, and I wish you a, a great stay in Muscat and a very successful and enjoyable stay and success in your mission here. Uh, sir, I have a small uh, clarification I need from you. Uh, this What's is your good name, brother? Uh, my name is Pradeep. Uh, my name is Pradeep. I'm a marketing professional working in Oman, in, in Muscat. Yeah. So uh, my question is, uh, I, I just want a clarification. Uh, this is something that's been uh, percolating in my mind. Uh, I've heard you say that Islam is about submitting to his will. Sorry, Islam is? About submitting to God's will. Correct. God, sorry, I didn't hear. God's will. God's will, yes. Yes. So in that context, uh, I, uh, this whole concept of offering dua, uh, prayer, supplication to God, asking him for something, whether it's blessings or good health or whatever, uh, isn't that, strictly speaking, against the concept of submitting to his will? Because if you have submitted to his will, then he decides and you accept whatever and keep going. But once you're asking him, that is uh, not just in Islam, in any faith, even, even as a Hindu, when I feel that when I'm asking God for something, it is in a way, it is, I'm not really completely submitted myself to him. I just want your clarification on this matter. Brother Pradeep has asked a very good question. Thank you, sir. And Brother, Pad Brother Pradeep is one of, the, uh, one, of, uh, one of my proof that I said in my lecture that most of the non-Muslims hear my talk, they love me. I'd like to thank you, Brother Pradeep. Thank you, thank you so much. He's been watching me for 15 years and he's happy to see me live. And he asked a question that Islam means submitting your will. And a Muslim is a person who submits his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So his question is, that when we ask dua from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so isn't it contradictory that we are going against his will? And the answer is no, brother. Submitting the will means Allah has given you certain guidelines. Few do's and don'ts. Everything else is optional. You know, people think, oh, Islam is very strict. Thousands of do's and thousands of don'ts. No, no. Only few do's and few don'ts. Further, you should believe in Tawheed, you should offer Salah, you should give Zakat, fast in the month of Ramadan, you have to do Hajj. Among the major do's and don'ts, there is a book called Qabair, written by Imam al dhabi the 70 major sins, which includes even the major faraiz. So these 70 are the major do's and don'ts. Then there are minor do's and don'ts. Major do's means the major faraiz, offering salah, giving zakat, doing hajj. 
And the major haram is not to take interest. You should not gamble. You should not have alcohol. You should not bribe. So these are the major do's and don'ts. And the remaining is optional. You can become a doctor. You can become an engineer. You can become a dai. You can become a lawyer. You can become an engineer. If I do the dua to Allah, make me a dai, am I going against Allah's will? No. Yes, if I say, oh Allah, make me a robber, then there's a problem. Because Allah says you should not rob. So if your dua is going against the guidelines of the Quran, then I agree with you, you are going against the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you cannot do a dua for doing something haram. You cannot do dua that I want to become an alcoholic. You cannot do a dua that I want to become a zani, I want to become an adulteress. You can do dua, doctor, engineer, lawyer, all are mubah. So your dua, if it's against the don'ts, then it is wrong. If your dua are not to do with this fard, I want to do dua that I don't want to offer salah. It's not accepted. So do you understand, brother? So if you do certain dua, very few dua, it will go against the will of Allah. And I don't know of any Muslim who does such dua. Maybe few here or there, if they're not in the right state of mind. But the other things which are mubah, you say, okay, I want to be rich. No problem. You can do dua which may not be very good, but you can do anything which is mubah. For example, you want to get a job in a good company, you can do dua to Allah. So, your dua is not going against the concept of submitting your will. It only goes if you do something which is against the commandment of Allah. Hope that answers the question, brother. Yes, brother, you can ask the next question. Hey, thank, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. That is very enlightening. Thank you. Anything else, brother? Do you have no, any no. other question? No, no, sir. There are a lot of questions, but uh, not now. No, for the non Muslim, we have exception. <laughs> the brothers are one at a time, but for non Muslim, they can ask a second question. No, no problem. Sir, I'll keep it for you. If you have any questions, you're most welcome. No, that is John, sir. We'll come. At maybe your show in uh, Sultan Qaboos University, I'll come. Sorry? Maybe your next show, I'll come for your next speech at uh, SQ. If you want, you can ask, brother. Any, any doubt, if you have any clarification regarding Islam, anything you feel which is wrong in Islam, this is your opportunity. What do, you, what do you feel is wrong with Islam? You can be comfortable here. You can attack Islam. You can attack Zakir. You can attack the Quran. What do you feel is wrong with Islam? I didn't get you, sir. What's that? Sorry? No, nothing wrong in Islam. But uh, there is another. Uh, can I ask you? This is about the uh, Prophet. Peace, to you. Peace be upon him. Any questions you can ask. No problem. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know. Again, I, there is a particular... Uh, quotation uh, or a saying, uh, something which uh, is attributed to Prophet Muhammad, which I find it a little uncharacteristic, sir. I mean, you're a doctor, you know more than uh, anybody else that uh, leprosy as a disease is one of the least infectious diseases. Sorry, which, which disease? Le leprosy. Leprosy as leprosy. a disease. Yes. It's one of the least infectious diseases and spreads only through a prolonged contact, I mean, contact with the person who's affected. So I read a, uh, a statement which, talk, which says that uh, He's, uh, the Prophet said, run away from a leper as you would run away from a lion. Mm -hmm. But I've also read that he has sat and actually dined and eaten food with a, a, a patient, a leprosy sufferer. Yes. So I, but then uh, when you say Jesus says, go heal the sick, and, th and at the same time when you're, when you're listening to this statement of uh, the Prophet, is that, I just want to check the veracity. Did he really say that or was it being falsely attributed? And, and the fact that he has actually partaken food with a, with a leprosy sufferer, uh, so I just want to know the truth of the matter. What, uh, is that really a statement made by him? Uh, I don't know which hadith you are referring to. No, I, this is completely from the net and also from a, a, a movie I saw on the Netflix called The Rise of Ottoman Empire, where this quotation is mentioned. And, and it's, it's there, it's available on the net that he has mentioned something like this. The brother asked a question that there's a hadith of the prophet that a person runs away from leprosy like a person runs away from a lion. And at the same time, the prophet did share the food uh, with a leper. So what does the hadith mean? What do you have to understand? Uh, no, not that, sir. I just want to know whether the, the prophet really said that because somebody who can sit and have a thing, I mean, I'm sure because it's that, that sentence that run away from him, like uh, you run away from a lion, does it, is a little uncharacteristic or uh, somewhat lacking in sensitivity, which I doubt whether he would have said it really. 
Or is it being falsely put on the net that something like this is... Uh, I'll brother, ask you a question. That is this hadith authentic hadith? Because yes, there are yes, many hadith yes, authentic yes. and there are zaif. But natural, when you get a hadith, you have to... If you give me the reference, I'll be in a better position. That is the reason I asked you the reference. Okay, okay. What uh, we understand, that all the hadith that are there in the Bukhari and the Muslim authentic, from the other Qutub al-Sitta, whether it be uh, uh, other hadith like Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, uh, Nasai, majority are Sahih but not all. There are other books in which there are more Zaif. So that's the reason when you get a hadith, you have to first analyze okay. whether the hadith is Sahih or not. Okay. As far as this hadith is concerned, I have not checked up okay. with the sources whether it's a Sahih or not. Okay. That's the reason I asked you the reference. Okay. If you're going to reference it, it would be easy for I, me I'm to... sorry, I don't have the reference there, but I've just read the scores that's available on the net and actually... I saw this quote uh, in this uh, Netflix series called Rise of Ottoman Empire. There is this uh, particular quote where he talks about that uh, Ottoman Empire uh, talks about what the Prophet said. And then that got me wondering, is that really there? So when I just went to the net and I found that it is there on the internet. But again, internet may not be always correct. There's so much of rubbish coming yes, on that. So. If it's a Sayyidi, we have to agree with it. If it's not authentic, then there are many hadith which are Zaif also. Okay. Thank you. Is Thank there you any so other question? Sir. No, no, sir, no, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, brother, uh, uh, brother, do you believe that there's one God? Uh, <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out uh, anything that helps me, I'll believe, sir. If God, one God, I don't know. My concept of God is evolving. I believe God could be truth, uh, like generation, organization, destruction, G-O-D, God. So I don't know. I'm still trying to find out, sir. And that's but the do you believe I, in one God or do you believe multiple, multiple gods? No, I believe that God could be one, deities could be many. I don't know whether I believe in God or I know there's God or... I'm trying to figure out. I'm just trying to figure out. My request to you would be, brother, that you do read the Quran. Maybe you have read it. If you read the translation of the Quran, then many of your, ans many of your queries will be answered. Sure, if sir. If you read the translation, you bring a great favor to me. Definitely, definitely, sir. Thank, Thank you very much, brother. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. So now we'll move to the, to the sister's side. Do we have a question from the sister's side? Any question? And Are there any non-Muslim who would like to ask a question? Any non-Muslim sister would like to ask a question? No, this Muslim. Is there any non-Muslim brother, any other non-Muslim brother would like to ask a question? We'd like to give them the first opportunity. Any non-Muslim brother who has a query regarding Islam, regarding my talk? Any non-Muslim? Uh, so you can come on the microphone no, here. We have one on top there. Do you have a mic? Yes, I do. I yes. do have a mic. Please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa barakatuh. My name is Debbie, and I have a question Sister, for you, you on, the, on the first floor or the second floor? Yeah, second one. Okay. Yes. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I do have a question for you. Um, you told us that the Quran has problems, like has solutions for the current problems we are facing as youth, as people in the world at the moment. So my question is, as youths currently most of us are facing a lot of mental health issues. You're constantly in a battle within yourself, in your mind, and you feel like you do not have solutions to those problems, whether it's therapy and all of these other things. So now my question is, how can the Quran help us in navigating that issue and um, can you kindly advise me on some of the verses I could read from the Quran to help me with, you know, everything. The sister asked a very important question. <clears throat> the sister has rightly said, in today's world, there are many people who have anguish who have mental problems, who have difficulty in thinking. So how can the Quran help them? And that's what I said in my talk, that the Quran is a solution to the problems of humanity. And especially, I told and I requested 
towards the end of my talk that you should read the Quran, the translation in the language you understand the best. Because, I mean, my father was a psychiatrist. I'm a medical doctor, a general physician. But my father was a psychiatrist, Malla Grandim Jannah. And, and he used to tell me also that if you read the Quran, many a times, you yourself may not know what is troubling in your mind. And when you read the Quran, the Quran is a unique book. When you read the Quran, you find that many of the things you were thinking, the reply is given in the Quran. And to read the full Quran will not take very long. Depending, if you want to read one chapter a day, it will take you 30 days. If you want to read two chapters a day, it will take you 15 days. If you read three chapters a day, it will take you 10 days. So sister, my request to you would be that if you read the translation of the Quran slowly with understanding, because the Quran is unique, yes. depending upon what your problem is, as the Quran says, that verily, you will, your hearts will find serenity. And the Quran, it has many solutions, okay. which normally, if you read a Quran and I read, both may look at it at a different angle. The beauty of the Quran is that the same verse, if a layman reads it, he thinks a different way. If an intellectual reads it, he thinks in a different way. A scientist reads it, he thinks in a different way. That they read in the tafasir of the Quran, one verse can have 20 meanings. And when a person who has problem, he thinks in his way. So when you read the Quran, <coughs> but naturally if you go to a person who's specialized, and if you discuss with the person what is the problem, he may be able to guide you. Just generally, if you ask me which verse to read, I say all the verses are good, mashallah. <laughs> but if you have a specific problem, like if you have a problem of alcoholism, the verse is Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse 90. If you have a problem of economics, then it is Surah Tawbah, it is Surah Bakra, chapter 2, verse 179. So I give a few examples in my talk. Okay. About poverty, about racism, about alcoholism, there's gambling. I can go on and on. So depending, and it's not good to talk about your problem in public generally system. You understand, no? Yeah. So what I would advise you, that generally, if you read the translation of the Quran, maybe two Jews a day, it may take an hour for you, or half an hour, maybe one Jews a day, yeah. with understanding, surely. There are high chances, the solution you'll find. If you don't find, you can surely ask with some of the Islamic Dawah centers, yeah. the people who are more well-versed, you know, depending upon, upon what the problem is. And they will be able, those people who are well-versed with the Quran, surely they will be able to guide you. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may your mental anguish be completely dissolved, will completely go away. But even by listening to the recitation of the Quran, there are many non-Muslims who I know that when you hear the recitation of the Quran, and I ended my talk, sister, with the verse of the Quran of Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse number 81, which says, Wakul jalak wadakal batil, when truth is hurled again, falsehood, falsehood perishes. And for falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. And it continues that the Quran has been sent down as a mercy to the believers. That means only by hearing the Quran. Many a times you get serenity. When I meet people who accepted Islam, they said, why you accept Islam? I like the Asan. Did you understand? They say, no. It is unique. So everyone has its own reason for liking it. And when you read the translation, each verse has a different dimension. That is the beauty of the Quran. So my request to you would be the same, which I said in the end of my talk, that you owe it to yourself. You may have read many books in your life to get a degree, to get a bachelor's degree, or educate yourself. Why don't you read one more book? One book. It is a book from a creator. You read it in the language you understand the best, and inshallah, it will solve most of your problems. Hope that's the question. Thank you, sir. Okay, any more non-Muslims from the brothers? Anyone else would like to pose a question? Anyone? Non-Muslim? From the sister side, do we have anyone who would like to pose a question, a non-Muslim? We don't have any? He's? He would like to... <laughs> Small. No. 
Okay, uh, please. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Um, my name is Muhammad Mustafa Khan. I'm from uh, Pakistan. I'm 10 years old. So I, I have a question. Um, What's your name, brother? Uh, Muhammad Mustafa Khan. Sorry? Uh, Muhammad Mustafa Khan. Muhammad Mustafa. Yes. Okay, fine. Yes, brother. Okay, uh, so uh, Hazrat Jibrail is uh, one of the most important angels. But, uh, Sorry, can you speak a bit slowly and away from the mic? Uh, yes. Yes. Hazrat Jibrail is the, one of the most important angels, right? So uh, his job was to reveal the books to uh, the prophets. But now the revelation is over, so what does he do now? What's his job? The brother, the brother has asked a very unique question. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, the children, they ask the best questions. <laughs> and they ask the toughest questions. The young brother has asked a question that one of the major role of Archangel Gabriel was to deliver the message of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the messengers. And he delivered the last and final message the Quran to, to our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Now, since there's going to be no other message, what is his role now? The point to be noted is that that was one of his major role. They may be he's having minor roles. That was one of his major role to deliver the message. That's the reason he was called as one of the best of the angels. And even the angels are referred to as messengers. Messenger is a person who delivers the message. There are messengers among the human beings, and even the angels are referred to as messengers. Regarding what he's doing now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has assigned every angel. That doesn't mean that every angel has to be doing work every time. Correct? Yes. It's not required. So whatever role Allah has prescribed to every angel, that angel does it. Whether it's 24 hours a day, whether it's 10 hours a day, whether it's 2 hours a day, or whether, whether it's resting. You know, many people retire. Yes. The angels don't retire. Huh? You know, many people, the, the angels don't retire. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who may say, okay, now you rest, now you do. Like the hadith says that there are 70,000 angels doing tawaf round, round the Kaaba. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has assigned each job. So based on what Allah has assigned, they're doing. If Allah says they should rest, they will rest. I'm not saying that Allah has asked Archangel Gabriel to rest. Allah alam, I don't know. So what Allah tells us, we know. What our beloved prophet says, we know. What we don't know, we don't know. So maybe he's resting. Maybe Allah has given him some other job, we don't know. But surely we know that he was one of the most important angels that the reason called Archangel Gabriel. Hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, can, we, can we give uh, chances to others? So one question at a time, yes. Um, thank you. Are there non-Muslim like to ask any question? Any non-Muslim would like to ask a question from the brother's side or from the sister's side? Where I see someone is pointing. Anyhow, while we continue with the question and sensing, there Where, is an Muslim? I think there is someone there yes, on top. Sorry, we cannot see because of the light. Yes, brother, most welcome. Yes, can you give him the mic? Yes, please. So the brother was saying there are no, non no non Muslims, you are wrong. Actually, you have to make them comfortable. So maybe you are scaring them. <laughs> Asalaamu Alaikum. Asalaamu Alaikum, Dr. Zakar Naik. Wa Alaikum Asalaam, Rahmatullah Barakatu. Chaudhary Bisharat YouTube. with you. Sorry? Chaudhary Bisharat with you. MashaAllah. Most welcome, Brother Chaudhary. Welcome to Oman again, sir. Thank you very much. Nice to see you physically again. You are with us 24 hours a day. MashaAllah. Yes. Today the Doctor, media is there. My question, I was just hearing a speech by somebody today that zakah can be given to needy and not needy. Could you please cal clarify that? Thank you. Sorry if I heard your question correctly. 
A zakat can be given to a needy and not needy. Needy and not needy. Needy or not needy. Yes. The brother asked a question. Thank you, that sir. That when you're discussing with someone, zakat can be given to a needy or not needy. The criteria to zakat can be given, there are eight categories. It's mentioned in Surah Tawba, chapter number nine, verse number 60, where Allah says, you can give zakat to a fuqara. That's a poor person. A definition fuqara means a person who has a saving of more than the nisab level, more than 85 grams of gold, he's called a fuqara, means a poor person, a fakir. So one first category to whom you can give zakat is a poor person. If he doesn't have a saving of more than 85 grams of gold, if he doesn't fall in the category of nisab, he's called as fuqara. Second is, the Quran says masakin, a needy. A needy means a person who has some requirement. He may have a saving of maybe more than 85 grams of gold, but he doesn't have a house. He becomes a needy. So you can give zakat money. He may have a saving of more than 85 grams of gold, which may be, I don't know, in Omani Riyadh, maybe a few lakh rupees. If I say in rupees, you're an Indian. But maybe he requires more money to buy a house. So you can give your zakat money to a person who's needy, who doesn't have a house, Maybe he wants a medical assistant, the person has a heart attack, he wants to do an operation, a bypass surgery, doesn't have money, he's needy. So he may not be a very poor person. He may be above the nisab level, but may require help for his operation. He may require help from his education. So the second category is needy. Needy means what is the requirement? of a person, whether it be for education, whether it be housing, it should not be extravagant. That is the second category. The third category, it is amilun, those who are engaged in collecting zakat. So if a person is leaving his job and is spending time in collecting, so what is his value that much he can take from the zakat? If he's doing a job and getting a salary of maybe a few thousand rupees, so he can see to it that that much equivalent he can take from the zakat money, amilun. Number four is muallah futul qulub. Those whose hearts are coming towards Islam. You can use your zakat money maybe for doing dawah activities to convince someone. He may be a rich person, but they're giving him literature, maybe about Islam, maybe translation of the Quran. He's not fuqara, he's not needy, but its heart is coming closer to Islam. Or maybe you can help him to solve his problem, and he may come closer to Islam. This is the fourth category. Number fifth is a garimun, a debtor. He's taking loan for some purpose, and if he's a debtor, you can use your zakat money and give it to him so that he can pay his debt. That is fifth category. Number six is freeing of a slave, to free a rikab. Freeing of a slave. You can use a zakat money to free a slave, to buy his freedom. Number seven is Ibn Sabil, a wayfarer. A person who's traveling, maybe somebody robs his luggage, he has no money, maybe a rich man, he wants ticket to go back home, so you can pay for his zakat money. You may not know that once he may not return the money, you can pay for his zakat money, he may be a rich man, he may be a millionaire, but now, he doesn't have money in his pocket to go back, so you can help from his zakat money. When he goes back, whether he repays or no, it's different. You can use your zakat money to help a wayfarer, a traveler. And the last category is fee sabilillah in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means you can spend in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe you can help a dai, you can help him for education, you can help him to build a madrasa. So various Categories come in fee sabilillah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this obligatory charity which I mentioned in my talk that 2.5% of your savings every lunar year you should give in charity. Any of these eight categories you can give. These are eight categories that have been prescribed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One category is masakin that is needy. The other may be needy, may not be needy. Of course, even a fukara is needy. So what the brother was telling you, tell you, Yes, you can give to a needy. You can also give to a person who is not needy. So if it falls in any of these eight categories, you are permitted to use your zakat. Hope that answers the question, brother. Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum. 
Are the same brother have any questions? I'm brother, you have any? I'm a different person. Brother, you have any other question? The same brother, can the microphone give it to you? Sorry, I cannot hear you. Inshallah, inshallah. <laughs> inshallah, if Allah wills. Inshallah, I'd love to have a cup of tea with you also. Inshallah, the time is short, you can contact the organizers and we can meet to have a cup of tea. With the non-Muslims, I'm available. And you are the guest of honors for us. Inshallah. Do contact the organizers. If you can contact the brother. Yes, maybe you can take his number then. Yes. And I mean it. Otherwise you say, Zakir Bayan is a big deal. Cup of tea, cup of coffee, inshallah. You are non-Muslim? Sorry, I can't hear you. Can you give the microphone to the brother, please? Possibly. Can you give the microphone to the brother, to brother Chaudhary? <laughs> yes, brother Chaudhary. Sorry, sir. Dr. Saab, it's the same place in al Khwar 33 near to Saeed bin Tamur Masjid. You've been there and your father been there. This is Chaudhary sorry, Bisharat sorry, with I, you. Uh, sorry, I cannot hear you clearly. I think the problem is in the system here. Normally, they should have a speaker so that I can hear. Many a time, the audience can hear, but I cannot hear because I'm on the stage. So normally, when I say a professional system, it should be a monitor speaker for myself. So can you repeat a bit slowly, brother? It's not your fault. It's the fault of the system. Sir, this is Chaudhary Bisharat with you, one of your friends. You've yes. been to my place. 15 years back, we had a cup of tea together near Saeed bin Tamur Masjid. And mashallah, your father uh, also has been to my house. Oh, mashallah, so, now I understand that. 15 years back, we had a cup of tea together. Yes, sir. Oh, mashallah, 15 years back. Well, I don't remember, you have a good memory, mashallah. That's and why I said in the beginning that it's nice to have you back in Oman after 15 years, but okay. you have been living with us 24 hours a day. Okay, may Allah be happy, inshallah. And, and, every year. And, and we pray that we get closer, inshallah. Inshallah. I'll inshallah. appreciate if you can spare some time. Thank inshallah. you, sir. It's my pleasure, Thank inshallah. you. God bless you. Jazakallah shukran. May Allah give you also blessing and hidayah, inshallah. No, we yes. should, we should, there is someone is asking there, and there is this guy who's asking here. So we'll give them also opportunity. Assalamu alaikum. I'm in the Salaam. second level. Second level. Second level on the right, left? No, on top, yeah, on top. On the right on side. Top. On the right side. Right side, okay, here. No, no, no here, on, here. Your, on your right left your side. <laughs> on your left side. <laughs> My right or your right? No, your, your left side. Your left side. Yes. I do have one question, but before I'm asking my question, I'm uh, really missing your one of your uh, inspirator, Dr. Israr Ahmad, because I have seen both of you in Sorry, Bangalore you? when you are giving you the grand lecture. Sorry, who are you missing? Dr. Israr Ahmad. Dr. Israr Ahmad, mashallah, yes. yeah. He's been because, very close to me, and yeah. Allah grant him Jannah. Yeah, because we do follow both of you. You are the team member. You are doing the great job for whole humankind. And we do appreciate and we do pray for both of you. Amen, amen. Uh, now my next, uh, the main reason of taking this mic, uh, in your lecture you have told that uh, Quran says if we pay zakah, it will solve the humanity, the poverty main problem. So I do have one concern. Uh, even though there is a clear instruction from Quran, but because of zakah, what the rule says, 2.5% we have to pay. But still in the Muslim community, we do have a lot of challenge regarding this. Still the poor people, poverty still exist. I believe we do have some responsibility which we are not doing collectively. Can you please enlighten what we can do in a concrete way so that we can really take the verse of this Quran to eradicate this social poverty issues. What, what are the weak links we do have that we are not eradicated since this holy book has given the right way? Brother asked a question that I said in my talk that Quran says that if you give zakat, the poverty will be eradicated. I said 
that if every rich human being in the world gives zakat, poverty will be right. That was my statement. That if every rich human being in the world gives zakat, poverty will be eradicated in this world. Leave aside the non-Muslims. Even the Muslims, we know that many of the Muslims, they don't give zakat what is due to them. Some may be giving part of it. Oh, this doesn't fall under the zakat, this doesn't fall. Some may be giving more than what is required. But even if the Muslims collectively, we know, according to me, the richest men in the world, according to me, are Muslims. Don't go on the Forbes list. Huh? The Forbes list is only those people who have listed companies. According to me, <laughs> among the 100 richest men in the world, 95 may be in the Gulf country. Because they have companies. The one oil company will be $200 billion, much more than Elon Musk or Bill Gates. One one company. The thing is there that, yes, the Muslims as a whole are a very charitable people, but unfortunately, we may not be very well organized. So the, the right system at the time of the Khalifa Rashidin was a Baitul Zakat or a Baitul Mal. If you have a Baitul Mal and if you collectively take Zakat, and if you distribute under one particular body, it is more powerful. But unfortunately today, we are living in different countries. We may not know whether the body collecting can we trust or not. So because we don't have that trust, that's the reason we give zakat the way we feel is right. Some may be right, some may be wrong. But the right system is if we have a baitul mal or a baitul zaka, a body collecting, if we collect one particular organization which has a bigger reach and knows how to spend correctly, it will be more effective than individual people giving. But whatever said and done, as long as we fulfill our basic requirement of giving the zakat, as per the Quran, we are doing our minimum duty. Correct? Now, when I made the statement that if every rich person gives zakat, it includes every human being, Muslim and non-Muslim put together. Even if as Muslims, Allah has given us the wealth, if you give the proper zakat, inshallah, we can at least solve the problems of the Muslims of the world. So, of course, we should see to it that Allah has given wealth to few people exorbitant. So, if these few people who Allah has given exorbitant wealth, if they give the charity the way the Quran prescribes, then inshallah, even the problems of the Muslim world will inshallah get solved. Now coming to your question, what can you do? What should you do? Is you as an individual should see that you are doing your duty. Allah will not question you, why did the billionaire did not give zakat? Allah will question you, if you are liable for zakat, did you give or not? So as far as you and I are concerned, we should see to it that we give our duty. And my, my recommendation always is that Zakat is the minimum for you have to give. But besides that, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 261, that if you give one corn in the way of Allah, subhanahu, that is charity, that besides Zakat. Besides Zakat, if you give charity, Allah says with every corn you give, every grain you give, Allah will give you seven years, each year bearing 100 corns. That means Allah will give you 700 times. In business terminology, it is 70,000% profit. So there is no business in the world except business with Allah where you can get 70,000% profit. So I recommend to my Muslim brothers, whether you are rich or poor, besides the minimum zakat that you have to give, why don't you commit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala additional 10% of your income every year. When you start giving 10%, Allah increases your income, then make it 20%. Make it 30, make it 40. And believe me, the more you give, the percentage with you becomes less, but the quantity remains more. And I've been a practical example to that. The more you give, and I tell, I told my son, see, when you're doing business, make Allah your business partner. And when you make Allah your business partner, you cannot make him a small partner. 
So minimum you have to give is 51% in the way of Allah. This is my recommendation, huh? not Quran. But this guidance you get from the hadith of the Prophet. And we have the example of Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. He gave half his wealth. Hazrat Abu Bakr gave everything. So I tell my son that when you are doing business, see to it, minimum you give 51% charity in the way of Allah. Why? Allah, you should be make him a, a bigger partner. And if you make Allah the partner, Allah will take care of your business. Zakat means purification. Zakat means increase. That you have to give 2.5% of your saving. But here, if you're making Allah your business partner, he will take care of your business. But when I recommend some people, oh, 20% too much. Too much test. What is too much? You start and see Allah will give you increment. I tell the businessman, start with 10% first of the profit besides your zakat. Make it 20, make it 30. Try and reach to 51% minimum. Keep on increasing as much as you can. The more you increase, the more benefit you get this world and the akhirah. Hope that answers the question, brother. So we have, uh, so normally this side is for the sisters. And you guys are, yeah, so we'll have probably one or two more questions depending. But before that, uh, there is one, one brother is there. Brothers can come here. Yeah? Can come here. yeah, brothers can come to that side, yes. Can, can you, yeah. Uh, Sheikh, I want to ask, uh, how can we deal with killer thoughts that we can see that is separating these days? Sorry, brother, where are you, brother? Uh, from... Okay. Yeah, what's the question, brother? Uh, I'm asking Why how... Why is the mic going to you? Mashallah, there is... Mashallah, brother, young, correct? No, you're healthy? <laughs> yeah. Are you young and healthy? Yeah, yeah. So why of don't you come here? I Why don't you come to the microphone? He's on a wheelchair. Oh, wheelchair. Yeah, oh, okay, yes, brother. Uh, how can we deal with scalar thoughts that separating these days? Sorry, how can you? How can you deal with the scalar thoughts that separating? Deal with thoughts. Scalar, uh, like uh, most of people these days. Sorry, I think the sound system is not very clear. I cannot understand the question. Maybe the audience or oh, secular. Because yeah, there's yeah. no microphone here. The professional system, as I said, yes, the hall is very good, mashallah. Uh, convention center. Please request the organizers that normally when you say a professional system, this is my field. There should be monitor speakers. You have such a beautiful hall, such expensive hall, beautiful lighting. Why don't you have two monitor speakers for the speaker? I request the management. Mashallah, you have got such a big hall, beautiful, everything. It doesn't cost much to have two monitor speakers for the person who's speaking. You know, when the musicians and haram they do, they have all these microphones. Why doesn't Adai have this? <laughs> the only requirement I told the organizers, I require a professional microphone system, that's it. I don't want to stay in a five-star hotel, like you sleep in the floor. I require a professional microphone system because if Adai is going at war, this is my weapon. If I don't have a professional microphone system, how can I speak? So you're asking a question, everyone is hearing except me and the person here. So they may be thinking this person is a fool, asking, repeat the question, repeat the question. <laughs> I'm not a fool because you all can hear the microphone, the, you know, I mean, uh, the speakers are facing you, not me. So can you repeat the question slowly, brother? Sorry to bother you. No problem. Uh, my question was, how can we deal with the scalar thoughts uh, that is separating these days? How can you deal with secular thoughts yes, that are thoughts. separating you with the deen? Yes, and we can see that it's separating these days. Uh, and uh, yes, the brother asked a question. Specifically, uh, the new generation is getting the, affected with this uh, thoughts that is separated in the websites and. Uh, how can we deal with secular thoughts? Correct. Yeah, That's yeah. the question. Brother asked a question that how can you deal with the secular thoughts that are coming into your mind and they're disturbing you? You know, many things, you know, you find in the world. And today, the whole world is a global village. Everything on the internet, you Google, you get the reply. You Google, good and bad, good and bad. It can take, it very good for dawah, very bad to take you away from deen also. And 
this is the problem that because the world has become a global village, you go on the net and you find many things which may take you away from your deen. So the best way to keep you on your deen is to see to it that every day you read the Quran. When these thoughts disturb you, and if you read the Quran along with translation, it will solve most of your problems. Try to see to it that you at least read one juz if you can, along with translation. So in one month, you have rehearsed and refreshed your memory, and most of the replies to these secular thoughts are there. It is there in the Quran. Now, because of the world becoming a global village, you find many views that are disturbing. And when you see in the Western world, they are keeping on changing the values of life. And if a person is not attached with the Quran, there are high chances that he may deviate. He goes to a Western country, to America, to London, or to educate himself, and he gets misguided. High chances. We have many of the Muslims you know, going to Western country. I'm not saying every Muslim that goes, but because of what they are taught in the schools, in the colleges, in the universities, intermingling of sexes, freedom of speech in the name of women liberalization, you know, they, they are taking away, they are talking about rights, but actually what they're doing, they're demoralizing them. So the best solution, brother, is that you should, depending upon the topic that is disturbing you, you should hear the talks of that dai, we give the solution to these topics. One thing is read the Quran. Second thing is certain dai that specialize in certain topics. Some in compiled religion, some in science, some in technology. So depending upon what is the thought that is disturbing you, one solution is read the Quran. The second is you hear the talks of those dai who are specialized in the topic. Hope that answers the question, brother. So I think uh, it's already, uh, uh, time is over. We cannot take any more questions. We have to go back. Yeah? Uh, brother, are you a gent or a lady? One. Are you a gent or a lady? Gent, then come here, please. Yeah. Why are you standing in the lady section? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> so you can't change your sex. Are you changing your sex? <laughs> please. Yeah. I mean, this, these are sexual. What's your name? You're a Muslim, no? You're a Muslim, then stand there. Non-Muslim, I can give exception. You cannot take the opportunity of a lady, <laughs> one microphone full order in for a lady, and you want to stand in the lady's queue. This is not correct. Yeah. So tomorrow, if the toilet is full of the gents, will go in the lady's toilet. Please. <laughs> Please, can you stand there? Respect the rules of the autumn, and let the ladies ask a question. You Are there ladies who have any questions? Yes. Oh, yes, sister. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Samira. How, what is the advice to become a best daya? MashaAllah. Our young daughter, our sister asked a question. What is the basic advice to become a daya? Number one, as I mentioned in my talk, the best profession in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a dai. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fusilla, chapter 41, verse number 33, وَمَنْ أَحَسَنُ قَالَ مِمَّنْ ضَوِي لَلَّهِ وَأَمِرُ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّ الْمِلَ مِرْسِمِينَ Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, works righteousness, and sees that I'm a Muslim? Number one, uh, number one is that you see to it that you enroll yourself in a good Islamic school. Because today's education, you know, we started a school in Bombay, Islamic International School, education for both the worlds, Deen and Dunya both. And the school was so successful that the government could not digest it. So the government tried the level best to close it and we gave it to somebody else. You could not run it that well. So number one is that you see to it that you ask your parents to enroll yourself in an Islamic school which has the best education of Deen and Dunya. You know, we had a school called Islamic International School in Bombay. Their main purpose was to give them the knowledge of deen and dunya. In our school, we teach Arabic, from the age of moment you join nursery, we teach them. 
from the age of three. By the time the student reaches standard five, he's half the Quran, along with the normal. We teach Arabic as a language, along with English. English and Arabic are the two major languages. Then the additional local language is taught. We teach in public speaking from the age of four, English public speaking, Arabic public speaking at the age of six. So imagine a child is confident. MashaAllah, when you're confident, MashaAllah asking the question at a very young age. So everything, this is the training. So we train them in our school when we have the annual function. We don't imitate Michael Jackson or all these, you know, stars and all. You know, it may be Sheikh Saud al Sharim, you know, the, the Imam of the Haram, or Da'ila Sheikh Ahmad Didad. We inculcate the Islamic ethics from the beginning. So if we join an Islamic school, which is specialized in following Quran and Sunnah, we see to it that they start wearing hijab at a young age. We see to it that when they wear the Islamic attire, it is Islamic, the towers above the ankle, you know, covering the head. We instill in the child so much that the child starts teaching the parents. The parent, they may not be following Islam that much, but the moment when we teach the children, we ask the parents also attend our lecture. So I advise for you, sister, that if we can join an uh, Islamic school, which has the best education for both the worlds. Besides that, the way they think, memorizing the Quran is easier at a young age than an elder age. The best age is to memorize between the age of six to nine, and you're that age. So see to it that you memorize the Quran. And in our school, when you do one hour a day, within three, four years, you memorize the Quran while doing your normal studies. In our school, we teach the martial arts. Every student, by the time they reach standard five, girl or boy, become black belt. You know, we have to be fit. The swimming is compulsory. Of course, many people are trying to copy our model, but they have not been that successful because our model is crazy. You know, we, our ratio is very low. The student-teacher ratio is very low. The student-teacher ratio is every, every three student, one teacher. For every one and a half student, there's one staff. So our teacher-student ratio is very low. It's expensive, so what we do, from the rich people, we charge more fees. For the poor people, we free. It's a non-profit school. So, of course, it's difficult to have such schools now that have that concept. But surely see to it that you enroll in Islamic school. You can do your health, learn, besides learn Arabic as a language from a young age. See to it, you learn the international language, also English. Besides that, see to it, once you pass, you see to it that you try and graduate into an Islamic university, if you want to be a Dai. And the same thing we did for my children, beside the school, all my three children, two daughters and my son, they are speaking Loka Fosa from the young age, three, four. Then they graduated from Jamitul Imam, my son, he did a bachelor's in Sharia from the Islamic University of uh, Riyadh. And both my daughters from Jamitul Nura. So my advice to you also, see to it, you enroll yourself in Islamic University so that you get the knowledge of the Sharia so that you can be a better Dai. At the same time, make yourself fluent in Arabic and English. You hear the lectures of Dai's, who you like, so that at a young age you can start memorizing the talks. When you memorize the talk, you know, the children can memorize very well. Allah has given everyone a capacity. Many children can memorize songs, you know, 50, 100 songs. I mean, this is garbage. You memorize the Quran, you memorize the speech of the Duats. So see to it that your life should be revolving around the Quran. And you make this as your priority about giving speeches, learning about public speeches. And there are training sessions. If you cannot, there's one option that we have online Alidaya. Last year, we launched a paid social media platform. Everyone knows about Netflix. Who doesn't know Netflix? Who doesn't know Netflix? MashaAllah, everyone knows Netflix. Who knows Alidaya? Raise your hand. Alidaya. Alidaya. Few people, maybe 20%. Alidaya, I call it the Islamic version of Netflix. It's a, it's a platform which is the largest video content platform Islamic in the world. It is the largest number of courses in the world, where we have top 40 English-speaking duas from all over the world. 
And recently, in January, two months back, we made it free. So the light version is absolutely free. If you want the premium version where you want to watch 4K, 8K, you have to pay. But the light version is free. You can enroll yourself. There is a Dawa training program called as Let's Become Effective Dais. It is a 700 hours program of 350 hours of recording where the techniques of Dawa are shared. It is done very professionally with 4K cameras. And in that 50 days, we recorded three petabytes. It's a Guinness Book of World Record. But they didn't agree. They said you have to inform us two months in advance. So it's a beautiful platform where there is a course on Dawa. Let's become effective. There are various other courses on Tafsir of the Quran and Hadith. You want to know about Hajj, you want to know about Salah. There are hundreds of courses, absolutely free. There are even programs for children. You go there and you put children's program, you will find our young girls of age of four and five giving speech in front of 10,000 people, 20,000 people in Bombay. You know, the way they confidently they speak. So we start training from a young age. So this is a good platform that you can enroll yourself. You can ask your parents to see to it that they enroll. It is free. And this will give you some guidance about many things of how to see to it that you involve Dawa in your life. Hope that answers the questions. Unfortunately, we cannot take any more questions. Uh, we have Suhoor. We need to go to Suhoor. Uh, let me remind you of, uh, no, we cannot take any more questions, sorry, yeah, we cannot, sorry, it's over, yeah. So, uh, we, no, it's already, yeah, I've been informed to, yes, I've been informed to close, yeah. So I want to remind you of uh, one more lecture of Dr. Zakhar Naik on Saturday, that will be about, the title of the, uh, of the, of the lecture will be Prophet Muhammad a mercy to the humankind on 25th of March at the Sultan Qaboos University. Also tomorrow we have Ta'aruf 6 uh, event, but in Ta'aruf you need to register, yeah? For the talk you don't require to register, but for tomorrow's event you require to register. So thank you very much. Also one more thing for any questions that you have, especially for the non-Muslims, you can always go to the Grand Mosque, to the Islamic Information Center. You take a copy of the Quran and you can ask questions there. Uh, thank you very much. Jazakallah khair, uh, Dr. Zakhar Naik, for the wonderful talk. And thank you very much for attending and see you, inshallah, in the next dars. Thank you. Jazakallah khair.